Good evening and welcome to the November 18, 2021 meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees. I'm Greg Musil, the chairman of the board. Uh, welcome to today's meeting. Uh, first item on the agenda, as always, is to honor our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have all six trustees here tonight, so we do have a quorum. Um, the next item is awards and recognition, and we're going to start with our student spotlight, uh, Shelby Winter. We hear Shelby on other occasions. Let's hear from her again tonight. Shelby, welcome to the meeting. Thank you so much. Um, as you all know, you probably usually see me as student senate president, but I thought I would talk about myself a little bit more here. Um, so I was born and raised um, in Johnson County my entire life in a household of six people. So with three other siblings, uh, it can get pretty hectic. Um, I, and then I attended Shawnee Mission East. During my time there, I participated in an array of activities, some including leadership positions. For example, I led the Lancer Band as drum major for two years, um, chaired a group of students at Casey Project, and I was a head editor of, the, of our arts and literary magazine, The Freelancer. Through these positions, I had my first taste of leadership experiences. And something that has always stuck with me in any part of that leadership training is that the person always comes first. So I take that and I try and apply it to any activity that I'm involved in. Um, after I graduated online um, in 2020, I decided it was the most financially sound option to start my higher education path at JCCC. Um, my ultimate career aspiration is to become a surgeon. So me and like 2,500 other students who were attending college for the first time. We navigated the totally online atmosphere um, because everything was, you know, this forced online campus. It was daunting to reach out in this virtual environment to find friends or clubs to be a part of. Um, many clubs were also defunct, so not having any student council experience of any sort, I decided to attend a couple of general assembly meetings that the student senate held um, in the spring semester. And then from there on, um, I got really involved. And um, just like being able to hear about upcoming events and stuff from the advisors in the student senate, um, I just got pulled more, more into um, what club life there was. Um, I'm so thankful to have like translated my past experiences into the wonderful position I currently have as JCCC Student Senate President. Um, I'm not only proud to be a student here, but to be so involved with the wonderful campus community um, that's working so hard to rebuild after last year's shutdown uh, with solid JCCC foundations under my feet. Um, the ways I've grown as a student and a leader gives me confidence to pursue uh, my next steps into medicine at UMKC. That's wonderful. What, what led you to want to be a surgeon? Um, Medicine in your family? or? Um, no one directly in my family um, is in medicine, but um, my past experiences, well, I played oboe in band all my life, and this is a really niche like um, thing to talk about, but we have to like make oboe reads sometimes, and that can be just very, um, just a very precise process. And I, I don't know, I really enjoy like working with people and being very like precise so and working with my hands. So that's Oboe is decided. a tough <laughs> instrument, so you're tough as well as <laughs> articulate and a leader. Uh, other questions, Trustee Snyder. Hi, thank you for being here and we've always appreciated your, your uh, upbeat reports. I hear that you're very active on campus, like at lunches and periods nights of the day, you go out in the courtyard and you talk to people. What, what is on students' minds? that we should know? Um, some things on students' minds, uh, I mean, at this point in the semester, it's very stress heavy. You know, the days are getting shorter. And um, I just, I think having mental health conversations and, you know, just being able to recognize and support students in that way, um, that's, that's what's on students' minds currently, just like, you know, needing uh, mental health support probably is what I would say. Good, thank you. 
Trustee Smith Everett and then Trustee Cook. Well, thank you so much for coming. I know it's a little intimidating to be standing here, and we really appreciate you coming and letting us learn more about you. Um, so mental health support has come up multiple times from students this year. What do you think is the next best thing that we at JCCC could do to support students in mental health? Currently, I do believe that we have awesome resources at um, the counseling department because I've um, spoke with Alex Wells and everything. And um, yeah, I think that's wonderful, but maybe just opening up more conversations about mental health is probably the next best step, you know, like marketing that, um, trying to reach out as best as we can. Because, so, you know, it's one of those things where it's like sometimes students don't realize like, how bad it is for themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you recognize it, you can, you can fix the problem. So just to make sure I'm hearing right, a public campaign to say it's okay to seek help. It's okay to need to talk about this. It's okay to um, not be feeling great and, and to need to find resources and there's ways you can do that on campus. Would yes. be helpful for students. Yes. Okay. I, I'm a really big fan of the show Ted Lasso. And um, they, that show has also really talked about how important it is to have conversations with male students uh, and males in general in our country that it's okay to say I need help. Do you feel a difference between the female students that you get to hang out with and the male students you get to hang out with in any way? Or trans students or any of our cisgender students? Do you feel any differences in different communities of that poll for mental health? Um, I do uh, realize that stigma of like males, um, uh, sorry, males or like, you know, other minority groups just like not being able to be supported as best as they can. Um, I, I try to create like, you know, a very personal bond with everyone that I, you know, interact with. So just being able to have those like person to person um, like foundations, I don't know, um, works really well for me in um, trying to be the best supportive person I can be with other people. So, but um, yeah, I definitely see where you're coming you from. You yeah. <laughs> on behalf of an entire group. As soon as it was out of my mouth, that was unreasonable to ask. So thank you for entertaining it. Thanks. Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Like uh, Trustee Smith, Everett, and Trustee Snyder, thanks for being here again, Shelby. You always represent yourself extremely well. I'd love to be 18 again, and let's for a moment say that I am. And I come to you and say, Shelby, I just don't know where to go for higher ed. What would you advise me, or how would you advise me, or why should I consider Johnson County Community College? What would you tell me? Absolutely. Um, I tell my friends on the regular who are, you know, undecided about their major or what they want to do concretely um, for higher education to, you know, come to Johnson County Community College because, you know, this is one of the, if not the best community college around. Um, and it's a super affordable and there's just so much support. Like, I, I am very proud to attend JCCC. Well, thank you. You've, you've uh, provided great leadership to our student senate and to our student body, so thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We will look forward to your next <laughs> time at the podium in about five minutes. <laughs> you the student senate report, but thank you very much for sharing a little bit more about your background. Thank you so much. Um, before we go on to the next time, I want to I want to mention something. We're in awards and recognitions, and there was a recognition today on campus at Yardley Hall, um, the celebration of life for Congressman Dennis Moore. And Yardley Hall was probably, I would guess, 80% full. Um, it was a very impressive crowd, a, a very impressive list of people who have been meaningful to this uh, community and to this community college. There to honor uh, Dennis um, and his life and his Stephanie and the family. Uh, and it was really, it was a very powerful event. Um, and I know several of us were able to be there, but Dennis was trustee of this college from 1993 to 1999. Uh, uh, was elected to the, the U.S. Congress thereafter and served until 2000, January of 2011. So uh, before that, he was a, a district attorney for Johnson County for 12 years. Um, probably very few people have given as much uh, public service to the county as Dennis did, and a significant part of that was to Johnson County Community College. So I thought it was worthwhile to recognize 
Dennis today, and we, we lost a, both a very good trustee and a very good human being. Um, uh, I did something I know Dennis would appreciate, and Dr. Bound and your team, uh, I guess the doc, document services, we have in our um, board room some new information. We have the mission of the college on my right, the vision of the college on the left, and then the six uh, goals or values of the college are around uh, the soffits at the top of the, build, uh, top of the room. So well, we've talked about that before, and I will compliment uh, Trustee Snyder for commenting on it so much it was almost harping, but <laughs> it was worth it because it will, I think it helps everybody in this room that comes in here to understand we do have a mission, we do have, we do have a vision, and we do have a value statement that was just adopted last month in our five-year strategic plan. So I, I want to thank you, Dr. Bown, uh, Paul, for, for continuing to bring it up, and the rest of the staff that did that. It's uh, much appreciated, and I think people that come in here will appreciate it as well. Thank you. Um, we have one other thing, one other item. Well, let me, first I want to, at this point, we have two of our trustee elect, trustees elect here today. Mark Hamill and Don Rattan are in the audience, and I don't know if, if the camera can focus on them on the front row, but congratulations on uh, the election, and we look forward to you joining the board in January. I know you have a, a lot of orientation coming up. But we appreciate your being here today, and I know that Trustee-elect Coaston, I believe, left town last night after today, maybe after the Charter Commission meeting, that Don and Joy and I all serve on uh, with joyful glee. So welcome. We look forward to seeing you again officially in January, and come back in December as well. Um, and then, Dr. Bound, do you have an, an announcement? We should roll clap, clap. 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 Dr. Bann, do you have a special um, I announcement? I do. And this is rare when I get up to walk around over here, but we thought this would be most appropriate. Um, so tonight, uh, trustees and members of the audience, um, we have the opportunity to recognize one of our trustees. Um, this trustee has been active in KCCT, uh, that's the Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, um, having served as president. Trustee has also uh, been the state coordinator for ACCT, the national organization, the Association of Community College Trustees, um, having been actively involved in that organization. Um, I had to, uh, w when we were in uh, San Diego for the national conference, had a chance to talk to Noah Brown, and uh, he reminded me just how much he appreciates um, th this trustee for his leadership over the years and involvement. And so tonight, um, we will recognize uh, Dr. Jerry Cook with a lifetime membership um, to the Association of Community College Trustees. <laughs> and so with that, Jerry, I'm going to say out of arm's length. Um, but we had somebody kind enough uh, to make this happen. And uh, this is just one of the ways that we can recognize your service. So thank you. Thank you. I am guessing, based on decades of knowing Jerry Cook, that he is not speechless. <laughs> uh, Jerry, congratulations. Do you, would you like to say anything? Um, well, uh, yes. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Bown, and I'll, I'll certainly extend my greetings to Noah Brown and all the people at ACCT. Um, but I, I don't have a lot to say because uh, people say, what are, you, what are you going to miss most about being on the Board of Trustees? And uh, I, my answer is that uh, I've tried to make decisions that are in the best interest of students in the teaching and learning process, which we uh, see across the board here. So uh, I, I'm not much for receiving these kinds of accolades. Uh, Terry Schleist, uh, are you listening? And, uh, <laughs> but, but I really appreciate it. It doesn't mean I don't appreciate it. But we're here for the students. And whatever we do should be for student outcomes. And so that's my thank you. I, I, Shelby and uh, all all of the students that come before us to talk about what this college has meant to them uh, when we talk about transforming lives and strengthening communities uh, really makes, uh, makes me feel good. And that's why I've done this. It's for people like you to make a difference in your lives. So thank you very much. I, I sincerely appreciate it. 
Next, next meeting we're going to have a, at four o'clock on December 16th, I believe it is, a reception for Dr. Cook and Trustee Snyder, um, who will uh, be, be leaving the board. Um, so everybody is invited to that at four o'clock in the collab, I am guessing, if I remember right. Yes. Is that right, Terry? But Jerry, thank you. Your, your ability to build relationships across the state and across the country uh, is unparalleled, I think, in my 11 years Thank on you. the board. Thank so you. this is well earned. <laughs> we get to the open forum portion of the meeting. The open forum portion is where uh, anyone can sign up and uh, make public comments to the board about items that are of interest to the college. Uh, typically, people are limited to five minutes. If there's a larger crowd, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than three minutes. In order to be recognized, somebody must register. If they're going to participate by Zoom uh, by 5 o'clock the day before the meeting, or you can sign up the day of the meeting up until 4.45 p.m. Uh, we have no speakers for tonight's open forum meeting, but it will continue for the December meeting and thereafter. Um, that gets us to board reports, and we'll ask Shelby to come back up as uh, Student Senate President. Tell us about Student Senate. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to look back and reflect on our super fun Halloween week that we had on campus. Uh, GSA held their Rocky Horror Picture Show movie, um, movie night and trick or treat for kids. Uh, had a wonderful turnout with clubs co-facilitating and Anime and Manga Club held a really successful cosplay party uh, partnered with Social Club. Um, in more educational events that have been going on, uh, Luna held a Latina leadership night and Model UN will be leaving for their conference this weekend. Weekend. And uh, Student Senate General Assemblies have been going really well. We've had guest speakers from um, Information Systems and um, the Chief Operating Officer, Mike Neal, uh, visiting. And then two new senators have been elected. Um, now, a big report, I guess, on JCCC gives. We are very excited um, about this event. Uh, so far, like, we have 18 families. Um, elected to be supported, which totals to about 200 gifts. Um, dining services will be donating 50% of their hot apple cider sales through December 17th, so be sure to stop by and get some hot apple cider. And then on December 1st, uh, that Wednesday, Student Senate will be hosting a JCCC Gives Market in the calm atrium from 10 to 1 p.m. And I'd like to leave you all with an invitation for our bingo night that same night, December 1st, uh, from 4 to 6 p.m. to support JCCC Gives. So JCCC Gives supports those 17 families uh, for support during the holidays um, when otherwise they might not have a holiday to celebrate, right? Right, 18, 18 families, 18 yeah. 18 families, yeah. Questions for Shelby? I think um, we've already harassed her enough. Right. <laughs> well, and everybody, everybody in the room and everybody online uh, consider making a donation to JCCC. One question, yes. real quick. Mr. Yeah, Chair. Trustee Cross. What high school did you go to, Shelby? I'm sorry. Um, I graduated from Shawnee Mission East. East, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Shelby. Thank you so much. Have a good Thanksgiving. <laughs> Enjoy the break. No stress. <laughs> Uh, next item is from our college lobbyist, uh, Mr. Dick Carter, who will appear by Zoom from his flag in Topeka. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am getting some popping feedback on my end, so if at any time you have difficulty hearing me, please let me know. Um, normally, we'd be getting ready for Thanksgiving next week, uh, and many people are, but in my world, uh, the talk is all about the imminent special session that will start on Monday. Uh, earlier this fall, the uh, legislative leadership appointed a government overreach committee to uh, look at things along the lines of vaccine mandates uh, that were being talked about at the federal level. Uh, the idea was to uh, hold uh, committee meetings and hearings uh, so that a special session would not be necessary. Uh, in the end, um, the signatures were collected uh, enough of two thirds of each body in the Senate and the House to uh, have the governor call, uh, an, abide by her constitutional duty to call a special session. And so that will happen on Monday, November 22nd. We think it'll be approximately two days. That's what, that's what everybody's saying. Uh, but once folks come to town, uh, it's anybody's game. Uh, we know that there is a bill that uh, that will be dealt with uh, at least first and foremost, and that that is 
um, carving out exceptions for vaccine mandates. That bill, interestingly, has been met with opposition from the state's leading um, conservative business chamber. And so we'll see how things play out. There aren't going to be uh, committee meetings like we might normally have when the legislature's in town. They're gonna go directly from uh, a hearing that was held this past Friday uh, and take the bill straight to the floor. Could be some other bills pop up. We know that at least one other legislator has talked about um, introducing or attaching an amendment related to contact tracing. I don't think that will happen. Um, legislative leaders want a clean bill. Uh, I don't believe a bill has been drafted along those lines, but we'll be watching for things like that. Uh, like I said, anytime the legislature's in town, even if they're called to town for a special purpose, um, any, anything can happen, and so we'll, we'll be watching closely. Uh, there'll be lots of rhetoric, uh, some, some talk for uh, postcards uh, will be going on uh, since we're approaching the election season next year for all legislators, or rather all House members uh, and state legislators. So uh, we'll be reporting after, uh, after that group meets uh, in Topeka next week. Hopefully it is only two days and folks can get home uh, to their families for the holiday. With revenues now projected uh, around 1.3 billion higher than expected, um, the legislative budget conversations uh, have have focused on tax cuts. Uh, we know that the governor has already proposed um, eliminating food sales tax. That's the 6.5 percent of sales tax at the state level. Doesn't touch the local amount. Talk uh, beginning about property tax cuts. We don't. There's no bill. There have been no hearings. We don't know exactly what form that could take. Uh, we know that the governor's budget recommendations, at least the initial review, would appear flat uh, and doesn't include the second year of maintenance of effort dollars. Uh, KACCT will be issuing a, uh, an appeal. They, they submitted that through the Board of Regents. Uh, the Board of Regents will also um, be offering an appeal, uh, essentially asking for restoration of, of those items not included uh, in the budget. Presently, the uh, issue, this, this, this will be one that, uh, that nobody wants to deal with moving forward. Presently, the issue of service areas is in the legislative media circles. It's not, not really widely talked about uh, outside of, of those, uh, those services that provide updates on what's going on in the, in the public policy arena. Um, like I said, not much traction there. Kansas State Board of Education wants open season uh, as it relates to community colleges. So they wanna be able to uh, have open access anywhere in the state. Uh, the Board of Regents controls that area and um, really has no reason to go down that road, but those conversations have occurred. Um, we've, we've seen a few articles out there uh, that talk about what has transpired or what has transpired. I think that the truth is somewhere in the middle uh, of all of those stories that are out there. Uh, everyone seems to be backtracking uh, at the present time. It's not really a legislative matter. This, this can be dealt with uh, in a policy manner by the Board of Regents. Um, but, but just because uh, the, the news is out there, uh, it, it could flow over into the legislative session. So that's something that we'll uh, be watching very closely. And then finally, uh, the legislative series that, uh, that we've done for a number of years uh, will be kicking off just after Thanksgiving. Uh, two lunch and breakfast uh, that we'll be hosting so that we can sit down and have conversations with our delegation uh, and get to know them uh, a little better, talk about some of the things that we're focusing on, give a, a brief college update. Uh, we sent out hard invitations uh, at the end of October, beginning of November, and then just this week followed up with uh, additional personalized emails. Uh, we've got 17 uh, folks that are, are going to be attending so far, that's pretty good. Only three have regretted, uh, and that, that is better than the numbers that we've had in years. And we anticipate that after uh, the emails that went out this week, we'll have a few more um, that we're following up with uh, agree to come and participate with us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think I would stop there. That kind of captures what has been going on and, and what we're looking forward to next week and, and in the uh, next few weeks. Thank you, Dick. Questions? Uh, Trustee Cook? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dick, uh, has there, do you have any, uh, any anticipation of the discussion if the sales tax goes away on grocery items? Has there been any discussion on what the revenue replacement will be, or will there be budget reductions or both? 
Um, I think that's part of why the budget, at least initially, looks flat uh, from the governor's uh, budget office. Uh, that will be debated throughout the entire legislative session. Uh, the food sales tax amount usually is talked about in the neighborhood of um, $450 million. And so uh, backfilling with, with some of those revenues, at least initially, is, is part of the plan. But uh, what does that look like in the out years when, when maybe times aren't that great? So uh, I, think, I think it will be a, a conversation that... Uh, uh, that will move along fairly quickly. Uh, everybody wants to, they've been talking about this issue for a number of years, uh, but I think this is the first time that it, it's uh, realistically uh, on the table for, for strong consideration. Thank you. Trustee Smith Everett. Um, my question may be better um, for Nancy. Um, Dick, if you can answer it, that's fine as well. So um, I'm thinking back to the meeting where, um, you'll have to forgive me, it was, a, it was a few months ago, it was a Regents meeting, there were only two community colleges present, I believe, in the room, and they decided to make a policy without even asking uh, the, the um, community college representatives in the room about that, and I'm, I'm just thinking about what Dick just said about um, some of the the pushes for open access and other things. I know that we have set our legislative agenda. Do we ever go lobby regents when this is something that would be in their boat? I mean, I'm, I, I genuinely don't know how that works, and I know that KACCT often leads the charge on how we tackle those issues, but I'm concerned about it bleeding into the legislature when it's really not um, in their purview to manage and then making things even stickier for us. Is it some, is, does it behoove us? Do we ever go to them, to the regents on behalf of the community colleges? Dick, do you want to go ahead and start with that and then? Or, sure, I will. Um, and I'll feel, yeah, I'll feel absolutely. What, what I know. Go ahead. Okay, very good. Yeah, no, we do we do work with um, the legislative agencies, and I would consider the Board of Regents, um, while they're not an executive uh, agency uh, under the uh, governor's purview, um, the regents are appointed by uh, a sitting governor. And so, yeah, absolutely, uh, we're having conversations. Uh, I know that Heather has had a number of conversations with, with a couple of regents. We also work directly with staff. Mm -hmm. The same holds true uh, at the um, Board of Education level, at the Kansas State Board of Education level. We'll, we will uh, monitor and, and discuss issues with um, board members or with their um, CEO, Randy Watson. So that does occur, absolutely. Thank you. I, I think the only thing that I would add to that is just the clarification of that meeting. It was a Board of Regents meeting that I attended, and Heather and I were both in the room. Mm -hmm. And they were discussing the leadership of the State Board of Ed meeting with the Board of Regents. That's right. And we were not included in that. And so Heather went to speak to, oh gosh, I think it was uh, Cynthia Lane who actually approached Heather and said, you guys need to be involved. And I had gone to Cheryl Harrison Lee who was chairing the Board of Regents. So that's, we went two different ways. Unbeknown, I mean, we just kind of did it. You know, we responded immediately. But I would concur with Dick that um, in Heather's weekly reports to the Council of Presidents, you know, she's all the time talking about the relationships that she has built, okay. the people that she's talking to. I think to take it a step further, I'm not sure that KACCT, that the president, has necessarily gone to those Board of Regents meetings. But I have felt the need to just be visible there mm -hmm. so that people do understand. And then it's not just Heather, mm -hmm. that it's that we are behind Heather. Mm -hmm. um, there are presidents who attend, and there's probably four or five presidents who attend. I know Dr. McLeod is on the, uh, on the Zoom. Uh, it just depends on who can be there in person or not. But I would suggest that we're very actively doing that. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what further is needed, but I think that trustee support to our own president to say, you know, whatever you need, let us know, mm -hmm. because I think our visibility is extremely important mm -hmm. right now. There's just a lot of movement. I don't know that it's more than has been in the past, but it just feels like the need to be present mm -hmm. on my part has been there. Thank so, you. You're welcome. Does that help? Dr. Brown? It, yeah, it answers my questions. And, and I would add to it that uh, in the Council of Presidents meeting yesterday, um, uh, Blake did say that 
um, but, you know, that we have a waiver system in place and that we should allow that to work. And he was holding firm um, on, uh, on a position that I think would be consistent with what our interest is. Okay. So in addition to that, we've also, the, the 19 presidents uh, together with Heather Morgan sent a letter to the regents um, expressing our our concern of opening up service areas. Okay. And, and at least without the involvement of right. community colleges. Right. And, okay. and I would share that that was signed by Alicia, who's the president yes. at yes. Uh, Fort, Fort Scott. Scott. And I signed that as well. Okay. So we've yep. done a lot of things to work forward to to together. Say, Absolutely. Thank you. So I, I hope that's okay to. Absolutely. To, it was correct. But yeah. yeah, we are very much in tune. I'm just Blake, being Blake Flanders, who's the yep, CEO sorry. of the Board of Regents, and the service area, basically, as I understand it, is a, an issue of concurrent enrollment with high school students who are obligated by the current service areas to take their concurrent courses from a community college that is assigned to them geographically. They can waive that and allow a, a student to take a course from another community college if it's not offered there. But it, it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, mix of policy and, and geographic uh, challenges to everybody. Uh, Trustee Cross and then Trustee Cook. Yeah, and thank you. And I know, Mr. Carter, I can't speak to this, but thank you for raising the issue of, uh, essentially it's, it amounts to dark store theory, right? The Johnson County asked Supreme Court to hear uh, the Walmart case, right? Yes, correct. And so the issue is, is that Walmart, and I'm just trying to understand this, and maybe Trustee Musil understands it better, or Kelsey and Nazar might, they essentially want to be taxed as if they were vacant and that they didn't have a lease upon which they, they obtained certain revenue, right? So they don't want to be taxed on their, the value of their lease. They want to be taxed on what the market value of rents would be in the county or in the area. Do I understand that right? That's basically right. They are arguing that on January 1, when every piece of property in the state is to be valued by its fair market value, what somebody would pay for it, they assume, and where the dark store theory came from, is that they're empty. There's not a Walmart in that, there's not a Target at 119th and Blue Valley Parkway. It is an empty building of 75 or 85,000 square feet. What would it be worth empty? And that is, yields a different value than if you consider it as a, good location that has a large retailer in it. Um, and that's a dilemma, I think, that is not clarified under Kansas law, and hopefully the Supreme Court will, will decide one way or the other. And I think, Dick, you would confirm that there are going to be legislative efforts to do something with property taxes, whether it's cut them or change them or shift them or, or deal with how valuations are done in the upcoming session. But we always talk about property taxes. It's very difficult to deal with it without unintended consequences. And if I may, Mr. Chair, I thank you for that explanation. I just had to read through a Law 360 article on the Kansas Walmart issue to understand it. And so essentially, um, and I thank Trustee Cook for his question about what's the replacement value for, for the revenue loss. And I mean, I, I don't like tax on food either, but we don't have mountains, we don't have beaches, so we need a tax source somewhere. So if we're cutting all these taxes and Walmart wants residents to pay more in taxes than they want to pay, I don't understand where we're going to get the money to do what we need to do. And I'm even challenging Governor Kelly here. I, I don't know where we're going to have the money to do, to fulfill our mission. Maybe I'm out of turn here. I'm just I'm curious. Is there any talk of where the replacement might come from? I'm, I'm reiterating Trustee Cook's question, Dick, but Mr. Carter, uh, but is there any revenue enhancements discussed at all? Yeah, there, th that's not part of the conversation right now. But, but your assessment is, is accurate. There will, there will be a shift to pay for the services somehow. Well, I, I think, and I think you're aware of this, Mr. Carter. I mean, we just got hammered by Moody's and revamped on our credit rating uh, because we're over-reliant on, on local taxes. And I, I fought and held a hard line to keep uh, tuition and fees low as, as have this board and various administrations. So it just puts those of us in local government in a tremendous pickle because Nobody wants to pay anything, but everybody wants these services. Mm -hmm. I thank you for listening, Mr. Carter. I know it's not your fault. I'm just talking. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Chair. We should blame 
dick for human nature. One dollar, Bob. One dollar. <laughs> want some services, but don't want to pay for them. <laughs> um, and I, I, I appreciate your rhetorical point, Lee, but I don't think we got hammered. Right. We got, we got dropped, I think, one level of rating on our, basically our bonds or our credit worthiness. We're getting set up. Because of the fact that we are so heavily relying on local property taxes. And, and yet I would, I would also remind us that we did receive the highest rating that a community college can right. receive. So, right. um, But it, it's a legitimate question. Thank I mean, you if, for correcting me. If property I, tax, I, if property like tax valuations are down significantly because of all those large stores, then we either have to, uh, the, our mill levy will not raise the same amount of money as it would if those values were up. So Quick it's a follow up, Mr. Chair. Thank yeah. you for correcting me. My wife says I'm hypersensitive, so I felt like a hammer to me. <laughs> I apologize. I, it was a revamp. Yeah. Uh, Trustee Cook. My comment was more of a review in response to Trustee Smith Everett's question of Nancy's answer and Dick Carter's answer. And I think for the benefit of the new board members, uh, as a review, there are really four pillars we have to address the Kansas Board of Regents. We have our local lobbyist effort with uh, Mr. Carter and with Kate Allen. We have KACCT representation as a member of KACCT and that lobbyist team. Nancy has referenced Heather, who's the CEO of KACCT. We have the Council of Presidents that uh, have a very direct line, and we have various staff members. Nancy referenced Dr. McLeod, but there are other staff members that participate as well in related activities with the Kansas Board of Regents. So I think those four pillars uh, are really strong in how we address uh, issues through and with the Kansas Board of Regents. Um. Mr. Chairman, if I could yes. just uh, follow up on that. Will you be available on call after January, or how can we, <laughs> what, is, what is the direct line? Thank you, you're very kind, but you, you, you know more than I can remember, so thank, thank you. Thank you for constantly He's educating for us, life, I appreciate yeah. it. All right, uh, thank you, Dick, for your continued service and uh, working with Dr. Bound, Nancy, Kate, and uh, Heather and the others that are interested in community colleges around the state of Kansas. Appreciate your time. Next, we'll hear from the Faculty Association, Dr. Andrea Vo. Vu? You, Vu? You. <laughs> My French is not that good. Well, and I don't think we use the French pronunciation, so it's, it adds to the confusion, yeah. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm, a, I'm Dr. Andrea View. I am an associate professor of political science and the vice chair of the Department of History and Political Science. Um, and I am also the secretary or recorder of the Faculty Association. Um, I'm here because Dr. Liker has asked me to present today as kind of a change of change up for you. So, so you can see a new face. Um, first, I do want to, we all want to congratulate the winners of the, uh, the recent election. And so congratulations on that. Um, we also want to thank all the current trustees for your service to the college. Um, I think it's safe to say that we're all committed to student engagement and success. And I appreciate your commitment to the college and its mission and vision and values. So thank you very much for that. Second, related to student engagement and success, um, one of the initiatives that I have been a part of on this campus is um, a, our campus-wide effort to educate and engage students in civic affairs. So I'm happy to report, thank you to John Clayton and his data, <laughs> um, that we have just received our 2020 student election turnout from the National Study of Learning Voting Engagement and the JCC student turnout rate in the 2020 elections was 63%. Um, this is more than 13% higher than it was in 2016. And um, the largest jumps were most pronounced in the 18 to 24 year old demographic where we saw an 18% increase, and then a 15% increase in the 22 to 24 year old demographic. Um, just as a refresher, in 2018, JCC student turnout was 45.5%, which was actually 23% higher than it was in 2014. So in the last two federal election cycles, we have had um, a double digit increase in student voter turnout. Um, so this is really promising. Obviously, I'm very pleased about this. Um, but this is very promising for several reasons. First, um, studies in political science show that voting is a habit forming 
thing. So once somebody starts to vote, they're more likely to be engaged civically in, their, in the future. Um, the second thing is one of JCC's student, uh, institutional learning outcomes, excuse me, is social responsibility. And um, so that we're encouraging students to be prepared to practice community engagement that reflects democratic citizenship, environmental responsibility, diversity, and international awareness. So what these days, recent data tell me is that we're not only fulfilling our institutional objectives, we're enabling students to be civically engaged throughout their lives. And I just think that's quite wonderful. That's right, yeah. Um, overall, I do want to thank Tara Karame, who is our former community learning coordinator, because she is the one who organized the core group of students, staff, faculty, and external partners, such as the League of Women Voters and Loud Light, um, to spearhead our campus voter engagement efforts. Uh, Tara, if you see this, um, thank you so much, because without you, would not be able to do this. So. Um, adding to that, I'm a little, um, while I might be a little bit biased as a political scientist, I want to reiterate the importance of civics education and civic engagement. Um, as a higher education institution, we have an obligation to the community to help students educate themselves about their communities, to understand the value and importance of being involved in the community, and also to learn about all the ways to become more engaged in their communities. In my own experience, the students here are hungry to learn more and they want to engage, they want to be informed. Um, if the recent electoral turnout and enrollments in political science are kind of any indication, student engagement will be continuing to grow. So in the last five years, just as a plug, um, political science courses, enrollment in political science courses has increased 22%. We're kind of bursting at the seams. Um, I know that my colleague, Dr. Brian Wright, who is, the, is also the advisor for the Model United Nations team and um, club, we're both very excited to see this renewed interest in civics. At, we as an institution are in a position to help students practice social responsibility. And we look forward to your continued support of those endeavors. Um, while we're on the topic of students and their success, I do believe it's important to identify another observation that I've had this semester in my classes. The students are exhausted. Um, they're more exhausted than I have ever seen in past semesters. I'm really concerned about the effect that this pandemic has had on our students. Um, basically, just what, from what they have shared with me, well, they were very excited to get back in the classroom and engage with people face to face. Um, they're starting to feel the pressure of that. So the having to be somewhere all the time after spending a year isolated at home, um, they, I don't think they were quite prepared for, for that, that shift. Um, so I've referred students to the early alert and other resources where appropriate, and, and we, have made our we have done our best there. Um, from my own observations, the exhaustion and burnout are more widespread and amplified than I've ever seen in past, in, in past years. So my hope is that we can examine um, student mental health needs and envision what additional resources can help us continue to support their success. I'm also hopeful that we can continue to engage with our employees to ensure they're not experiencing the same pandemic-related exhaustion. Okay, third, I am the co-chair of the college's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, and I want to just take a, a, a moment to give you a brief synopsis of kind of what we've been up to. So one, our committee emerged out of a task force last spring and was asked to review the MGT consultant's report about diversity, equity, and inclusion at JCCC. We have over 60 committee members from all around the college. All of the branches are represented. We have full-time and part-time staff. We have full-time faculty, adjunct faculty, students, and administrators. Everybody who volunteered to be on the committee is on the committee. We welcome and included everyone that asked. Uh, we met regularly throughout the summer and fall to read the MGT report together, to review best practices from other institutions, and to identify recommendations of implementable actions at JCCC. Initially, our meetings consisted of in-depth brainstorming, and later we broke into subgroups to sort of synthesize that work, as you know how brainstorming sessions can be, um, and kind of synthesize the notes from our brainstorming. We're very happy um, to see that JCCC is reiterating its commitment to, to, to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the strategic plan. And many of us have participated in the SWAT sessions, the goal development teams, the action step development teams, and the metrics team. 
We are still in conversations about the best means of achieving JCCC's diversity, equity, and inclusion goals and ensuring that we fulfill our mission, vision, and values, and whether a continuation of the status quo is or is not something that gets us to where we want to be. And, almost done. <laughs> And we look forward to sharing our final recommendations and engaging um, in thoughtful discussions about those recommendations. Finally, I do want to recognize several faculty members who have received external recognitions since the last board meeting. Uh, number one, Dr. Jay Antle, who is a professor of history and the executive director of JCC Center for Sustainability, was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Impact Award from the Climate and Energy Project for his impact on sustainability work across campus. Our Center, our Center for State Sustainability and its staff are nationally recognized um, as a leader among community colleges and as a, a leader among higher education more generally, and we really do want to thank them for their work because they do a lot of really good work on this campus. Um, Dr. D Dr. David Vanderham, who is an assistant professor of humanities, was recently awarded a Richard Waterman Jr. Scholar Prize for his article titled, I Am Just an Armless Guitarist. Tony Melendez, Disability and the Social Construction of Virtuosity um, from the popular music section of the Society on Ethnomusicology. Yes. And then finally, two English professors, Matthew Schmier and Steve Workmeister, shared their poetry and fiction at the Riverfront Reading Series last Friday, November 12th. And so with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much that, for, for the detailed update. Um, we usually, Oh, allow grilling of Dr. Liker, so I don't know if there, ah, may, there may be questions here. You're right, I just ran. So, I'm an introvert. This is very... There may be questions. Trustee Cross? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Professor View, for being here. I, I guess I went to school with you and your sister. <laughs> it's true, well, Lawrence. We talked about that a few times, so thank you for being here tonight. And um, when I was in San Diego for ACCT, uh, I sat through a, a seminar by one uh, conferee, I forget which one, talking about the stress on students. And I didn't realize how stressful it was exactly uh, in terms of depression, mental health, uh, STIs. Mm -hmm. I read recently how uh, uh, drug overdoses have been high and have contributed to the overdeaths uh, that the CDC and other world governments have accounted for. I mean, are you seeing that anecdotally in your students? I, I would... Um... Unfortunately, when students are dealing with depression, a lot of times there's that stigma of they don't want to say anything. So what I would see more or less with depression is that they're less likely to come into the classroom and engage with me. Um, so part of my um, mission this semester has been to use that early alert system to have, beyond me just reaching out to them, have another party reach out to them, just to know that somebody beyond your professor cares. Um, but yes, over time, once they get to know you, they do tend to tell you things. And I would say that there, there is kind of an elevated sense of depression and more or less anxiety. I don't, I mean, I'll just give you an anecdote. I actually, coming into this semester, thought this might be an, a little bit of an issue. So I kind of tried to streamline my course assignments so that that was like less of a burden. And they're still struggling. Um, so I just don't think they were quite prepared for kind of rebalancing their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, before they were able to do all this work at home and they didn't have to be somewhere so they could kind of have some structure around their home life. Now they have to be somewhere and then also have the structure to get the work done. Um, going back to just, uh, if I might, to your earlier question, I honestly think that maybe some sort of support group system um, where they can communicate with their peers mm -hmm and learn that they're not the only ones that are dealing with this. Um, one of the big things in one of my classes this semester is once someone, you know, we started talking about this exhaustion and someone admitted that they were having an issue, everyone else around was like, oh good, it's not just me, right? Because they kind of tend to internalize that. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes to what you're talking about with the depression. Yeah, I just, I was shocked to learn it. Um, I know I'd read different commentators and I think some of the people that, that have opposed masks or, or pandemic protocols um, may not fully consider the ramifications of domestic violence or other issues that, that have happened, some of the downsides of being stuck at home. So uh, I appreciate your comments. I mean, you're literally on the front lines dealing with them. And, you know, if there's anything we could do, I mean, we're politicians and we like to sit around and talk and come up with ideas to solve the problems of the world. But 
but you're there dealing with it, so, so thank you for being here. Yeah, I mean, mental health resources, I think, if I might, I, I know that we have a lot of them on campus, and I think that going back to earlier comments, uh, maybe some sort of publicized campaign just to, so students are m more aware. Because um, we all try to tell them at the beginning of the semester and then remind them, but you know, sometimes they're not prepared to hear it. Um, so having a more public facing, like this, these are your resources, this is where you can go, um, I think that would go a long way as well. Trustee Smith Everett. Um, Dr. Butte, thank you very much for being here. To piggyback on that, um, I, I wanted to ask Dr. Bown if you could report back to us in December, if we can have a discussion on what, or maybe the committee of the whole, yep. and have a discussion on what is available, what can we do more of. Um, I know I can only speak for K-12, uh, it's the same. And both the educators and the students are feeling it, and no one can exactly identify why, but it's more difficult, it's more anxious, more anxiety producing, and. I think um, being able to admit it is a very big step for some and very, very difficult. So anything we can do to break down those barriers we should be doing because this may be the only safe place for a student to get help in right. their lives and maybe the only time in their lives where they could get it fairly easily. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I want to ask if you would mind emailing us all that all the statistics you had at the very beginning of your report. Oh, yeah. I well, couldn't write fast enough and you had such great statistics on the voting and the numbers and I'd love to have that. And to be fair, these all, um, John Clayton's office actually does uh, house course. all that data. So yeah, I actually reached out to his office to get the, the information. But yeah, I can totally email this to you. Thank you. And, and I, we can get you the actual report. Um, so, uh, yep. which was oh, great. what she was okay. referencing. So, yeah, Wonderful. absolutely. That'd be great. It, uh, Trustee Ingram. Yeah, the other thing that I just want to mention, I don't want this to get lost. This has been something that when it comes from K-12 transitions to the community college, one of the places that, that I have been very concerned about and have spoken about and sit on the Mental Health Center Advisory Board and talk about is the transition of these young people who have received services in K-12 and do they know where to go once they leave K-12. Mm -hmm. And so I think never losing sight of that too. And so many of these kids come here from Johnson County, but it's just a matter of, you know, I, I had heard from faculty when I first became a trustee of, you know, they were identifying them in the classroom and taking them over to counseling mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, it's, it's really hard when you've received those services in K-12. You can go into your counselor, the counselor knows you, the counselor knows your story and all of that, and then you come somewhere else, wherever that might be, and they have to bring that story and share it again. Mm -hmm. And they've already shared it, mm -hmm. and it's so hard to do that. So I still think some sort of linkage as we begin to have these conversations in K-12 is, is gonna help everyone to translate. Yeah. In addition to that, if you recall, at the last meeting, you all approved um, in the, I think it was part of the consent agenda, uh, but we approved um, a, a contract with yes. Johnson County Mental Health um, to have a clinician here on site. Um, and I think that's a next step in this work. Um, and so I know, it, having been in those conversations, um, that there's, there's work that's being done about how do we draw those connections between what is a student, a traditional age college student who's moving from, you know, completing high school to coming directly to us or shortly, you know, a relative short amount of time they would have experienced certain services at the, at, at, in the K-12 experience, um, and how do we make sure that we bring those together um, here? So that was very much a part of the conversation with Johnson County Mental Health um, and with our team, so. And uh, translating the zero reasons why, zero too. Reasons why. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trustee Smith yes. Everett, I think yes. it's, that is starting to occur in college settings now mm -hmm. because those students have had it in K-12. So I would anticipate that being another piece, too. So I'm sorry, but I just nope. wanted to make sure that we were clearly sharing. I mean, I think we are realizing, mm -hmm. only just beginning to realize the layers that the pandemic has done, the things that happened behind closed doors as a result of being shut down and really um, then the stress of then reincorporating ourselves into a society and a whole world that we were living in didn't realize um, the, the <laughs> ways in which we were already exhausted. So um, I, I, 
I completely agree with you, and I think we can do a lot more to transition. I also want to grab students for whom this is the first time they've experienced um, any kind of crisis or mental health struggles, and it's okay uh, to get help. Trustee Cross. Yeah, just very quick, and I'd just like to reiterate, I, I've had a number of colleagues, and frankly, judges ask how, you know, the pandemic wasn't a staycation, and I'm like, it was the furthest thing from <laughs> a staycation. I mean, <laughs> early when we're homeschooling our kids and virtual schooling our kids, and then as parents of young kids, not having a vaccine for kids and only now getting it and still having breakthrough uh, illnesses. I mean, it's just plum stressful and um, a constant worry. So I just wanted to voice that as a parent of young kids and uh, say thank you for raising the issue, Professor View. I think what we know is that there are a ton of resources on this campus for students, not just in the mental health realm, but in tutoring and learning services. And our biggest problem is getting the students aware of them and to them. Mm -hmm. And um, faculty are front line on that to help them. And I know Chris and his team and Randy and Mickey all try to get that out too, but we, we need to utilize the services that are out there and make sure they know they're available. And, and it, you're the front line and the first step in that process, so thank you for doing that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next item is the Johnson County Education Research Triangle Report by Trustee Cross. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, the Johnson County Education Research Triangle. And I thought I'd beat you to the punch tonight and, and let you know that the Johnson County Education Research Triangle, JSER, was created in November 2008 when residents invested the county's future in the county's future by voting for a one-eighth sales tax. The proceeds of this tax first assessed in April 2009 generate millions of dollars to fund higher ed, higher education, and degree offerings through a unique partnership among the Johnson County, University of Kansas, and Kansas State University. And more information can be found, of course, at uh, jococotriangle.com. We, we did meet uh, Mr. Chair last month on October 25th. It was supposed to be at K-State Olathe, uh, but we met by Zoom. Uh, Mayor Dunn called us to order. We had a, um, uh, an auditor's report. Uh, we went through a public relations update. Uh, each of the schools, K-State, KU Edwards, and KU Med uh, Center pr presented uh, different updates. And then we had a, a approval of different invoices. And I believe Mayor Mike Baim and I are gonna be on a subcommittee to review current contracts that we have with uh, our vendors. Um, we'll meet again uh, in April. Um, and I did want to conclude, Mr. Chair, that our revenues for the year are up 13.8% uh, from where they were uh, last year. So that's good news as we do see uh, some rebounding in the economy. And uh, it's been my pleasure to serve on that uh, board. And I thank this board for that opportunity. And Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you. Questions of Trustee Cross on JSERT? <clears throat> If not, the next item on the agenda is the Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Trustee Ingram. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we do have our next meeting coming up at Pratt Community College. It will be on December 3rd and 4th, which is a Friday, Saturday. Once again, uh, the Council of Presidents will meet on that Friday, and we will join in about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, hopefully everyone, I know there was a question last month about the legislative priorities of KACCT. I believe those were sent out to all the trustees. So if you did not receive them, let me know, but we'll make sure that you have those in hand so you can make the comparison between our priorities and KACCT's priorities, but extremely similar. Um, I will share <coughs> that uh, some of the, the topics that we will be discussing um, at our meeting, we have Regent John Rolfe who is coming. So we do have one of the Board of Regents will be there. We also have someone from K, uh, the Kansas Association of School Boards who's gonna be talking about good boardsmanship with changing boards, tough issues and opportunities. That will be on Friday afternoon. And then Saturday morning, we will have an ACC report out and that will include some of us who were just at, in San Diego at ACCT um, and we will also have a report from someone named Georgia Masterson who is the wife of John Masterson who is the president at Allen County Community College and she will be talking about leadership and understanding socioeconomic differences and impact on community colleges, students, staff and leadership. 
Uh, then we have a couple of legislators who will be there tentatively scheduled as Representative Stephen Johnson and Senator Larry Alley. And that's pretty typical. Wherever we are, we usually have someone from the legislature come. Um, but this time we we're able to have both a rep and a senator there. And then there will be a legislative 101, which will include a federal update, state budget update, and legislative update. So um, recentering the service area is some of the things that um, our lobbyists just referred to earlier in our conversation and report. Um, service areas, uh, you know, the hot topics will be discussed that day. Um, we have not voted on our legislative priorities. Mm -hmm. There's still a couple of weeks until we meet. So we will have that vote uh, at that time. And uh, I just don't know that there won't be anything added to what you have in your hands right now. But we'll update you on that at our next board meeting here. Um, I just wanted to say I'm really pleased that you were recognized. Um, one of the reasons that I'm involved in KACCT is because of Dr. Cook and needing someone to serve as a liaison from this board at KACCT. And I knew how much that meant to him. So the recognition tonight is really appreciated. So he is highly thought of, and uh, we're just grateful for everything that you've done. We're also grateful to be back meeting in person. You know, the richness of what we can provide at KACCT is the relationships that we build uh, over our state and uniting behind those priorities that we have. So we want a strong system. That's what we're all about. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Is there an opportunity to participate by Zoom, or is it an in-person yes. only? Yes. No, it, it will be. Right okay. now, I mean, we'll we're get. still navigating that. Well, as long um, as I, we will get a Zoom link if we want to participate in parts of it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Great. Third and fourth at Pratt, is that right? Yes. Pratt. yes. Madam Trustee, yes. thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, the last uh, report we have is from the foundation, Trustee Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, foundation's executive committee met on October 26th, and during this meeting, the uh, committee received a presentation from the foundation's external auditors, Reuben Brown. Uh, the audit found no issues, and this audit is noteworthy because uh, last year during 2020, when the pandemic hit, there were several procedures that had to be adopted um, and adjusted, and the foundation team did a great job uh, getting everything in line and moving forward to support students. The uh, investment committee chaired by Foundation Treasurer Pam Pop met on November 2nd and received the quarterly investment report. And the next Foundation Board of Directors meeting is on January 26th. Thank you to everyone that joined us last Saturday night uh, for the Some Enchanted Evening virtual celebration. If you didn't see it, you can still go online and see it. And while it was not the same as being there in person, it was still a successful opportunity to recognize the 2021 Johnson County of the Year, Clay Blair. Uh, Clay Blair has done so much for this community and, and continues with his generosity and isn't going anywhere, so it's nice to be able to recognize him. And then former trustee John Stewart gave a nice introduction of Clay, uh, so look for that as well. The event showcased multiple students. Um, they were involved in the video and, and really showed their support for the foundation and how they've been impacted. So that was nice. And then all the supporters of the foundation were also recognized. The uh, event ended up, along with the opportunity campaign, Summit Chain Evening Opportunity Campaign, raised more than $900,000 for student scholarships and student basic needs. So all in all, a very successful event. And speaking of Summit Chain Opportunity, the foundation's 2020 some Chant Evening Opportunity Campaign, uh, which was held last year in 2020, was recently awarded two gold awards at the Nonprofit Connect 2021 Philly Awards. The campaign was recognized as the top overall fundraising campaign for large nonprofits and the best in-house project, meaning it was done uh, in-house by our own team, not an outside marketing agency. So congratulations to the foundation, but importantly to uh, the marketing and strategic communications team and the uh, video services team. Finally, uh, you all know that the Tuesday after Thanksgiving is Giving Tuesday. The foundation has a campaign for that. All the donations will be going to the Student Basic Needs Center, so you can go online and, and look for that at, at uh, jccc.edu, Giving Tuesday, backslash Giving Tuesday, but it will also be on social media, so look for that. That concludes my report. Okay, all good news. Trustee Cross, do you have a question? Yeah, it's, it's been my pleasure, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I uh, served with Trustee Snyder uh, as a liaison to the foundation. 
And uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Trustee Snyder uh, for his service. I wanted to steal this opportunity to say it and hope that you, you'll continue to be involved on, on our board uh, in the years to come. And um, well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to serve. Another very successful effort. I think, if I remember right, did we give out 1.7 million in scholarships? So. Another record because of the generosity of the community. So uh, Saturday night was another uh, piece of evidence of that. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll move on to the committee reports. The first item is Collegial Steering Committee. That report will be given by me, um, but I couldn't find my notes last night, Dr. Bam, uh, from our meeting. We had a meeting uh, the first Thursday in December, and we talked about good things coming out of COVID um, and bad things coming out of COVID. And there were a number of things that, that we discussed, including the issues of isolation and some of the things we've talked about here that are bad things and, and good things about learning to pivot. Uh, faculty that never wanted to teach online, Finding out that teaching online is okay. Um, also appreciating the fact to get back into the classroom um, is kind of a good thing. Uh, so that's that's the, the gist of my report because I didn't have all, I could not find my notes. Dr. Bound, do you want to add anything? And I'm trying to think of. I, I think that was a good summary. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to put them down on paper and send them out to you. Nancy? I'm, I am the board secretary. Do I need to come to collegial steering? <laughs> to, it would be very helpful, or at least. It's, uh, it's uh, an offer. Help it's me with an board. organizational system. Sorry. Thank you. We'll That's move true. into the committee of the whole report. Uh, Trustee Cross is going to do the committee of the whole report. We had a number of items that we considered at the committee of the whole that need action tonight. Lee? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The committee of the whole minutes can be found in your board packet uh, from pages 1 through 28. Uh, we did meet by Zoom uh, at 8.30 on November 1. Dr. Bound, Trustee Musil, uh, and the rest of us uh, met that morning. That morning, uh, Trustee Snyder was absent. Uh, we reviewed data from the 2021 uh, outcome metrics. Um, he, Dr. Bound reviewed the annualized enrollment, fall to fall retention, fall to spring retention, and credentials metrics that both overall and then disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and sex. Uh, the legislative principles can be found on page one uh, through two. Uh, we did a review of the committee of the whole process. Uh, and uh, frankly, as I'm trying to blow through some of this, Mr. Chair, but in terms of the legislative um, principles, I did want to just reiterate that in a nutshell, we believe in local control and having local purview uh, for issues that, that, that has long been the custom policy of this board. Uh, we did review the committee of the whole process. We reviewed uh, the issue of uh, having a nominating committee and the nominating uh, process. Uh, we reviewed at length the compensation plan uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the college campus. And it is therefore, Mr. Chair, the recommendation of the committee of the whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the compensation plan as shown in this packet. And I would so move. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Smith Everett to approve the compensation plan as shown in the board packet. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion passes 6 0. Uh, Mr. Chair, we also took the opportunity to discuss changes to our non discrimination policy, which can be found at pages uh, 5 and 6. And uh, the Committee of the Whole has reviewed the recommended changes to the non-discrimination policy, 411.01. .01. The recommended changes clarify that JCCC is an equal opportunity, an equal access institution, and an affirmative action employer, and adds ancestry, parental status, and military health, military status, excuse me. So therefore, Mr. Chair, it is the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole and that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve modification to the non-discrimination policy for 11.01 .01, as shown subsequently in the board packet. And I would so move. I'll second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Ingram to approve the recommendation modifying the non-discrimination policy. Any discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6-0. Okay, Mr. Chair, next, um, the Committee of the Whole uh, reviewed the recommended changes to the job classifications, assignments, and audit policy for 18.01. .01. The recommended changes incorporate information from the definition of job classification policy for 18.02 .02 
and add a reference to the compensation plan proposed by Human Resources. It is therefore, Mr. Chair, the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve modification to job classifications, assignments, and audit policy 418.01 as shown subsequently in this board packet. I would so move. Second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Snyder to approve the recommendation and modifications to job classifications, assignments, and audit policy. Any additional questions or discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. That motion carries 6-0. And next, Mr. Chair, the Committee of the Whole reviewed the recommendation, the recommended deletion of the definition of job classifications policy 418.02. The recommended changes move the information from the definition of job classifications policy 418.02 to the job classifications and assignments and audit policy 418.01. Therefore, Mr. Chair, it is the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve deletion of the definition of job classifications policy 418.02 as shown subsequently in the board packet. I would so move. Second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Snyder to approve the recommendation deleting the definition of job classifications policy 418.02. Further questions or discussion? If Kelsey and Nazar will just let me know if I miss anything. Yes. Worry, we're watching this. Yeah. A big buzzer will go off. Okay. <laughs> she buzzer. is here. There's <laughs> stuff will drop down from the ceiling. It'll be, it'll be a good show. Thank you. Uh, if not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6-0. Next, Mr. Chair, the Committee of the Whole reviewed the recommended changes to the compensation policy 418.04. Recommended changes set out the required content of a compensation plan to be approved by the Board of Trustees annually and delegate its creation to human resources and the ability to employ employee employees in accordance with the compensation plan to the President. Uh, therefore, Mr. Chair, it is the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve modification to the compensation policy 418.04 as shown subsequently in the Board Packet. And I so move. Second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Ingram to approve the recommendation modifying compensation policy 418.04. Again, I'll remind everybody, we have gone through these in some detail at the Committee of the Whole. I know. Um, so we've thought about it. It's not that we don't have questions or discussion. We've already, we've exhausted Do, do I always have to make the motion or can Trustee Snyder do that? It, somebody else can make the motion. But okay. I mean, I just feel odd. Like, I'm just talking. Okay. <laughs> um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6-0. Uh, next, Mr. Chair, the Committee of the Whole reviewed the recommended deletion of the overtime compensation policy, 418.06. The recommended changes move the information from the overtime compensation policy, 418.06, to the compensation plan. Therefore, Mr. Chair, it is the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve deletion of the overtime compensation policy, 418.06, as shown subsequently herein. So moved. Moved by Trustee, Cro Trustee Smith Everett, <laughs> seconded okay. by Trustee Snyder to approve the recommendation deleting the overtime compensation policy 418.06. Discussion or questions? Not all in favor say aye. Yes. Aye. aye. Opposed no. That carries 6-0. We're getting there, Lee. Thank you. Next, Mr. <laughs> Chair, the Committee of the Whole reviewed the recommended changes to the Employment Benefits Policy 419.00. The recommended changes remove references to the webpage maintained by Human Resources. Nice job, by the way. And clarify that leave is a benefit. Mr. Chair, it is therefore recommended by the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve modification to employee Employment Benefits Policy 419.00 as shown subsequently in this board packet. I so move. Second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Snyder to accept the recommendation modifying the employee benefits policy 419.00. Questions or comments? I would just like to comment as well that we had a very robust discussion about this, a very thorough explanation at Committee of the Whole, and I really appreciated um, all of the work that has gone into updating these policies so that we're 
um, we really have HR policies that um, can help us move forward with our next goal. So we Good are point. trying to get through I know, <laughs> 78 excellent. billion of these, but right. we have said uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I think it's also uh, important to know that on these 418 policies, uh, they do not apply to bargaining unit employees. I, I hope we don't have bargaining unit people out there saying, what's going on here? They're changing all these compensation issues. They don't apply to the president, adjuncts, or other similarly situated positions. So be calm. Don't get excited. This has nothing to do with the bargaining unit. So go ahead. Thank you. I'll just note for the record, Mr. Chair, he's kidding. I, Mr. Trustee Cook was kidding. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6 0. All right, next, Mr. Chair, the Committee of the Whole reviewed the recommended changes to the whistleblower policy, 424.08. The recommended changes clean up the language to clarify that any individual may make a report against the college personnel and no individual may be retaliated against for such report. It is the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole, Mr. Chair, that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve modification to Whistleblower Policy 424.08, as shown herein. So moved. Moved by Trustee Ingram. Second. Seconded by Trustee Smith-Everett to accept the re recommendation modifying the Whistleblower Policy 424.08. Further discussion or questions? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6 0. Okay, now I've confused myself. Okay, here we are. One more. You One more policy there. change. Almost. The Committee of the Whole, Mr. Chair, has reviewed the recommended changes to the Social Media Policy 520.00. The recommended changes clean up language to improve clarity regarding the applicability of the Social Media Policy 520.00. Therefore, Mr. Chair, is the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve modification to the Social Media Policy 520.00 as shown subsequently in this board packet? I like social media, so moved. Moved by, Second. Moved by Trustee Smith-Everett, seconded by Trustee Ingram to approve the recommendation modifying Social Media Policy 520.00. Other questions or comments? We have a lot of bureaucracy here. Yeah. I love it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6 0. Henry, I'm not sure if this is why Jim asked you to do this, knowing that there were these nine policy changes we had to do, yeah. but you might get him for that. Yeah. Dr. Brown. Just real quick, I might, and I might ask um, Dr. Leslie Harden, our Vice President for Human Resources, I just want to clarify something about um, policies and applic uh, applicability to uh, bargaining unit and other employees. So just a clarification. Dr. Yeah. Harden. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leslie Harden, Vice President for Human Resources. I just want to clarify one point, Jerry, uh, Dr. Cook, um, is that the, the compensation plan that you approved very first does not pertain to bargaining unit employees. However, some of the 418 policies that we have that may not be here may, may impact them um, from, from just federal regulations is all. Thank you. Thank you. We have two bid packages, I believe, and then we can release you until the next item, which is the treasurer's <laughs> report. <laughs> okay, I, I apologize. Um, so there, there is uh, two different bid packages in here. I don't believe, oh, I do have, bid, oh, excuse me, okay. So on page 24, we have another recommendation, Mr. Chair, uh, from the Committee of the Whole. You know, you were there. Uh, that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration, who was also there. Uh, to approve the single source justification to TOPCO for the installation of a facility count and ADA parking solution for $185,282, Mr. Chair. For the Galileo parking garage, are there any questions or is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded Second. by Trustee Smith Everett. Any questions or comments about the Galileo parking garage facilities and ADA parking uh, solutions? Not all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6 0. Next, Mr. Chair, we have an award of bids, RFP, single purchase of $150,000 plus 
uh, that we reviewed. Uh, it is the recommendation, Mr. Chair, of the Committee of the Whole that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the low bids from SGI in the amount of $866,730 for the OHEC Police Academy and East Plant Cooling Tower, Barnes and Dodge in the amount of $402,000 for the COMs, GEB, SC, and ITC buildings, and Stanger Industries in the amount of $127,593 for the MTC, NMO, CA and ITC buildings with an additional 10% contingency of $139,632 to allow for possible unforeseen costs for the 22-034 HVAC improvements, various buildings for a total estimated expenditure, Mr. Chair, of $1,535,955 and I so move. Whew. Second. Moved by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Ingram. Could you go through that one more time? <laughs> well, you can see it there, Mr. Chair, on page 25. <laughs> and we're recommending that the Committee of the Whole... I the got it, right here on page 25. Uh, other questions or discussions? This involves, lo they're all low bids for individual buildings, HVAC projects. Yes. Um, all in favor say aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Opposed, no. Those low bids are approved 6-0. Finally, Mr. Chair, there's some additional information items about the 2021 annual audit uh, charter review, the proposed 2021 internal audit plan and IS audit uh, plan at page 26, and then I believe uh, the administration has included a committee of the whole working agenda on pages 27 and 28 uh, to understand uh, the purpose of the committee of the whole, which as I understand it and justify and rationalize it in my head, is that we're there to learn what information we're going to talk about essentially in the uh, this meeting. So we do it twice. All right. Thank you, Lee. That was a bigger load, almost as big as when we have all of our health, disability, vision, and other bids, which usually come in June. Oh, no, no, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to give you the opportunity to give the Treasurer's report now. Uh, thanks to uh, Rachel Lears and the administration, the grace of the administration, uh, the Treasurer's report is uh, page 29 of your packet, uh, dated November 4th, 2021. Uh, the following pages contain the Treasurer's report for the month ended December 30th, uh, 2021. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits. And it is the recommendation of the college administration, Mr. Chair, that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's report for the month ended September 2021, subject to some audit. Is there a second? So, oh. right, so move, move, sorry. Oh, moved sorry. by Trustee Cross, seconded by Trustee Smith Everett to accept the Treasurer's report for the month ending September 30, 2021, subject to audit. Any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Opposed, no. Motion carries 6-0. Dr. Bown, where do your monthly report? All right. Well, thank you very much, trustees and audience. Happy to provide a monthly report to you. As I kick it off, though, I'd like to start out with an update from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, uh, where our Cavalier volleyball team won their first match. Whee! And... Uh, 3-0, uh, um, and they face, uh, I believe, Sauk Valley um, in the uh, quarterfinal round yet tonight. So mm -hmm. it's going to be a long night. What so. tournament would that be? That would be the uh, NJCAA uh, Division II National Championship Tournament. So there are 16 mm -hmm. teams competing. Um, uh, if you win in the first round, you move into the winner's bracket. If you um, uh, don't win your first match, then you uh, slide into the consolation bracket. Um, and so the good news is uh, they're on a run to defend their national championship. It's going to be a, a, a very good competition. So there you go. Last year, you got to watch mm -hmm. um, uh, an, a uh, match where we held our breath for the last... I don't know, 10 minutes, 10 minutes as they were, yeah. Anyways, that's not that's one of the reasons why we're here. All right, here we go. All right, so my report uh, today, uh, you get to spend some time with uh, Shelby Winter. Uh, again, it, it is, for me, it's such a privilege to bring our students uh, into this meeting and give you the chance to interact with them. And, and uh, Shelby's another fine example of the students that we serve here. Um, I, I will say this, and, and I think um, uh, Trustee Snyder alluded to it. Um, I, 
Anytime I walk out the door at the end of, by my office out of GEB, it seems like I see Shelby out there interacting with students. Um, and I mean that with such deep respect for the seriousness he gives, she gives um, her role and I greatly appreciate her leadership on behalf of our students. All right, so uh, you got to meet Shelby. All right, let's talk, let's jump into enrollment numbers. Um, and so we're going to look at fall and we're going to take a quick snapshot into um, spring. So as we've been saying, we, we um, anticipate that the fall semester was going to be somewhere between one, two percent down. Um, I ask um, uh, uh, John Clayton what he thought uh, where it would end. And, and uh, as we get closer and closer to the end of the semester, we think we're pretty much about where we're going to be. It's about two percent down. Uh, that is certainly uh, not where we want to be um, as we move forward, um, but it is, I would say, from a positive standpoint, uh, if you find the silver lining in this, it is that the, the decline that we've seen is slowing and that we're seeing a, 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 a healthier return uh, to campus. Can you um, clarify a down from what, from it, last year? Down from last year, yes. Yeah. So if we look at, um, we're down 2% uh, in headcount, 3.7% um, in credit hours um, compared to last year. It's, it's uh, when you compare pre-pandemic, um, we're down uh, about 9.6% um, and 8% um, from 2019. Um, I, I, we are... Um, uh, we're off um, somewhat more in full-time students in terms of a, a decline more in full-time students than we see in part-time students and more in women than we've seen in men. And I, I think the, the women, the, the, the uh, decline we've seen in, in uh, our female students um, and male students in general, but I think, um, uh, be careful what I say here, um, our students balance a lot. Um, and I know that many of our students, particularly those that are single parents, um, are balancing even more in terms of being a student, balancing all the complexities that we face. And so um, I think we see some of that in our um, uh, enrollment. Where we do see, um, uh, saw some increases uh, this fall are in the number of students uh, pursuing associate and uh, certificate degree pathways. Um, but down in non-degree students. Our evening students are up um, in terms of students enrolled predominantly in the evening. First time students are up um, and up in previously attended. So again, this is where I think we see, and we'll see this um, in community college student enrollment, is that they aren't necessarily, I'm here in the fall, I'm here in the spring, I'm here in the summer, I'm here the next fall, right? It, we'll, we'll see a student start with us um, be with us in the fall, may be out during the um, spring semester and come back again the following fall like we're experiencing now. And we're seeing, to me, that's, there's an encouraging sign in that and students are re-engaging um, with us. Um, we are up in uh, developmental uh, reading and writing courses, uh, but down in our developmental math courses. If we switch now and look at the um, uh, continuing ed um, enrollment where we're at. Um, if we look at it, we're 122% of where we were at this point in time last year um, and 101% of where we were um, last year at the end of term. Um, and so we are uh, currently uh, roughly 90% of where we are anticipate being at the end of the fall semester for a continuing ed standpoint. If we compare that though to um, um, 2019, we're at about 64% of where we were in 2019 um, and um, about 57% of where we were for total fall enrollment. If I were looking at continuing ed, um, thanks to uh, Elisa Waldman and the team, um, we are uh, about 3% um, ahead of where we were at this point in time last year looking at uh, spring enrollment. All right. So now let's look real quickly into the spring enrollment um, as it stands today. Again, remember, we're looking at point in time, comparing where we are today to the start of the spring semester. This year's spring semester, 
looking at a year ago where we at the same number of days from the start of the spring semester. So trying to give you a point in time comparison. We're at about 2.8% 2, 2 ahead of last year in terms of both headcount and in credit hours. Um, we are up um, from an enrollment standpoint, all of our minority populations except for Asian and non-resident alien students. Um, and we are up in evening uh, enrollment. Again, we're quite a ways from the start of the semester, and so we want to be cautious with it, but uh, the good news is we are seeing um, a, a positive trend. We're up in, uh, in 18 to 21 year olds, down in 22 to 24 year olds, and up again in the 25 to 59 year old uh, student population. And we're up in terms of students who are enrolling for the first time, as well as up for students who are continuing, meaning they would be enrolled in this semester. Um, and in order to be on track, just to break even with last year, uh, we'd need to enroll uh, 650 students per week in order to hit the number to be flat compared to next year. So our goal is to be up more than the 650 students compared to last year. That's the enrollment report. <laughs> Stop there. Yes, sir. Uh, what's the cutoff date for spring registration? Uh, um, Dr. McLeod? It will be, the cutoff date is always the first day of classes with exceptions made for students with adverse circumstances, then it's the first week yep. of classes. Yep. Thank you. And the first day of classes for the spring semester is? Uh, the Yeah, it's a Tuesday, let me look. 18th? Okay, so we have some time. Yep, yes. yes. I think yeah. that's about the day Iowa State gets serious about basketball. <laughs> it's about right. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. All right, then continuing on with the report, um, what I thought we'd do tonight is, is uh, um, uh, begin to give you a, just an update in terms of what's happening within the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art. And I believe you had a chance to meet uh, Joanne Northrup, who's our new executive director and chief curator. Um, I think you came to a meeting like right at the beginning of the meeting, and um, so it was a brief introduction, but we thought this would be a good time uh, to provide an update on the fantastic work that's happening there. So I just you know, as we think about her joining our team, and I look back at her experience and the things that impressed me as we were going through the interview process, um, while it wouldn't appear so, she does bring 30 plus years of experience um, in art muse museums, not only across the United States, but Europe. Um, she uh, comes to us from the uh, Nevada Museum of Art in Reno, and she also has one of the things that I was really pleased with is her experience in the higher ed um, art museum and understanding the important integration both not only with the community but within our own campus community and the way that we engage and that she and the team will engage and have been engaging our faculty and students. So um, with that, I'd like you to get to spend some time with uh, Joanne Northrup. So Joanne. Thank you, President Bown, and I want to thank the Board of Trustees for your service and for uh, making it possible for me to be here. Um, so thrilled to be the new Executive Director of the Nerman. I'm following in some really great footsteps. Um, Bruce Hartman is a tough act to follow. Um, so luckily we're friends, and he's, <laughs> been, he's been giving me great advice, and um, he's not going away. He's still our friend and um, and so things are going really well. I've been on the job for almost four months and so I just wanted to show you uh, a few slides about what we're doing now and what we have coming up. I'm very excited to share this with you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so the first slide is the exhibition that we opened on November 4th, um, Charlotte Street Foundation Fellows 2020. This is an ongoing collaboration with a Kansas City uh, nonprofit, Charlotte Street Foundation, and annually they award three artists from the greater Kansas City metropolitan area with very generous um, awards so they can make new art 
And then they have an exhibition at one of three different venues, and the Nerman is one of them. So um, this has been a strange year for the fellows. They uh, got the award in 2019, the pandemic happened, and then everything was sort of on pause. Um, and so when I started, I basically, in my first week, I had a meeting um, with Charlotte Street Foundation and said, we're going to open this in three months. Are you guys ready? So uh, everyone worked really hard, and we have three amazing artists. Um, on the left is Corey Immig. Um, she has done an installation in the lobby. It's very exciting because you can walk through the curtain, and people are always uncertain about that kind of thing in an art museum. Like, am I supposed to? touch this. Um, in the center is Glenisha, who has done a remarkable installation in the Oppenheimer New Media Gallery on the second floor. Um, it includes music, um, paintings. The entire gallery was painted green. And when it was painted, I, I contacted her and said, this is what you wanted, right? Um, and she said, I'm happy with the color that it is. So thankfully, um, check that one out. And then on the right is Kathy Liao, and she has taken over the Cone Gallery um, and installed three very major large works and one piece that she finished just in time to be in the exhibition. So um, it'll be on view through April 24th, and I hope you'll stop by. I'm available for private tours, so just let me know. Um, and the next slide, please. Um, so the Kansas Focus Gallery is the first gallery that you see when you walk into the lobby. It's to the right, and it's got glass doors. And, and I started thinking about, well, Kansas Focus Gallery, so it's artists who are from Kansas. Um, it could be people from the Kansas City metropolitan area or artists that live elsewhere um, that were born and raised in Kansas. So I decided to reach out to Lawrence, uh, Kansas-based artist, Hong, Hong Zhang, and um, offered her an exhibition in the Kansas Focus Gallery. Now, um, Hong studied in China for three years the fine, um, fine ink painting. Um, so she has mastered that technique and she uses it on hair. So hair is sort of her, her leitmotif in all the work she does. So, um, so we've titled it Extensions. Little joke there. Um, so that is going to be a very exciting um, evening on the 27th because her show will open and we'll also have a talk given by the Charlotte Street Foundation Fellows from 2020. Um, so start the, the year off with a bang. And final slide, please. And then finally, I wanted to give you a glimpse of an exhibition that's opening in five months. Um, it's my first major exhibition. Um, it will be in the temporary galleries um, at the Nerman. And I reached out to an artist whose work I'd admired for many years. Um, Shanique Smith is originally from Baltimore. Then she moved to New York, and now she's in Los Angeles. Um, she works very often with fabric. Um, I think she has a family uh, relationship because her mother studied fashion in Paris, so it's always been part of her life. And she does these wonderful calligraphic swirls, and her work is colorful, joyful, hopeful, and I think it's going to be a real smash. She's also going to do a performance, and I'm working with uh, a couple institutions in Kansas City um, to see if they might host so that we can collaborate together. So i um, really excited about things that are coming up. Um, we have a full staff. We just added an assistant registrar after uh, not having one for a while. And I am just really thankful to be here. And thank you again. And welcome to the new trustees. I look forward to seeing you at the Nerman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Um, about the if we have time? Yes. Uh, I was just no. curious about what, what, what the attendance has been at the museum. You know, are we back to 2019 levels or not quite? Or um, Not quite, but I would say that Charlotte Stream Foundation was the perfect um, sort of re-entry exhibition because they are all based in Kansas City. So we've had a steady flow of visitors, people that know the artists that have been coming in. So it's very pleasing to see people coming back. Good. Yes. Good question. Lee, and then Laura. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Um, 
I don't know that we've met, so thank you. Pleasure to meet uh, you. Bruce Hartman was an incredible asset, and you have his ability to sell things. And I don't know how, how you have time to do it all and put it all together, so thank you. Uh, I did, uh, mostly for our new trustees' benefit, want to reiterate, we, we have a little bit of art at this college. <laughs> <laughs> Just 300 pieces or so <laughs> across campus. And so Ms. Ms. Northup, correct? Am I saying that right? Um, we have a lot of benefactors that, that loan us their art, and yes. we, we, we uh, helped uh, house it, and it, it appreciates here. And so we have, it's my understanding, we have very wealthy people that, that lend us uh, their art and we're able to display it here, is that correct? No, actually the work is donated. So it's part of the permanent well, collection of the Nerman, yes. So we, we have a lot of major benefactors that, that, that donate their art and then we, we get to display it here. Yes, yes. Okay. I, I think that's a key way that we help community outreach and, and, and seek uh, support for the college through a lot of different mm -hmm. um, socioeconomic levels including high ones and so i just wanted to point that out for the benefit of the new trustees that we have yeah. tremendous public support yeah. uh, for what you do and for what we do here so yes that's what brought me here <laughs> I, I appreciate you <laughs> feeling very uh, lucky you know, you know it's a beautiful time <laughs> my, my question is um about our student um involvement or access to the nerman um i didn't i don't want to put you on the spot with you know, numbers, but I'm just generally curious because actually Dr. Bound and I were having a discussion about the artwork in this hallway, mm -hmm. which is Native American artwork, um, and that um, students today feel sort of intimidated by formal art. Um, I was an undergrad at William Jewell College and was exposed to um, art that I probably wouldn't have been in other circumstances, and it gave me such a better understanding of more formal art, and I, I've been grateful for that. How do you see the role of Nerman and um, exposing or bringing our students in or making them feel part of all the richness that Nerman offers. Mm -hmm. In fact, we were just talking about that. We have a visiting uh, Fulbright scholar who was interviewing the staff at the Nerman about this today. Um, we do have classes come in. There was just a class that came in this evening. Um, so. We have a lot of classes, not just art history, um, English classes, um, history classes that come in and use our collection. But I think the most unique thing is the 300 artworks that are spread throughout campus, because even if the Nerman is closed, they have access to it. And I have to say that it's a very accessible place. It's free. You know, all the programs are free, um, so students can wander in. But if that is not really the, the kind of thing that they do, if they go straight to classes and then back home, um, just walking through the hallways, through osmosis, they're being exposed to great art. And um, I think that, that that is something that I appreciate so much about what Bruce Hartman did and, and just the idea to share it with the entire campus. Um, and so I think that really is, they may not know it, but they just ate their lunch next to a great work of art. Um, and that's, that's not typical, and, and it's not typical to have such a spectacular collection at a community college. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Jerry, then Nancy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Joanne, I appreciate your reference to Bruce and um, your vast experience to want to come here. I remember a story uh, several years ago, Bruce Hartman had some of his friends from the East Coast, of which were mostly professors, curators uh, of four-year universities, major universities of which I won't mention. And one of them was standing outside literally in tears and I said to Bruce, by the way, this group came to visit the Nelson, but Bruce in his uncanny way talked them into coming out here for lunch <laughs> and took them through the, the museum. And this person was literally in tears, and I said, what's wrong with him? And he said, he can't believe that a community college has this museum and this uh, list of exhibits that they own. Mm -hmm. He's been trying for years at this major university to get a museum like it. Uh, we've been written up internationally as one of the top museums in the world uh, of contemporary art. 
the collection is fantastic. Uh, it's, it's again another example of I'm not sure our community appreciates and understands the resource that's here and you mentioned really no cost. <laughs> Might have lunch <laughs> uh, in the... Um, uh, cafe Tempo. Cafe Tempo. Cafe Tempo. Uh, uh, the, what's the cafe name? Tempo. Uh, cafe Tempe. Tempo. Uh, anyway, I forget the name of the restaurant. But anyway, the little cafe there. Uh, go through the museum. Uh, and, and to Laura Smith's Everett point about students, I know when we open the Thads building. Mm -hmm which is our arts studio for students. I know that Bruce worked with them to set up displays. So I know that uh, you have continued that, Joanne, in terms of making sure that all departments of the college uh, understand the resource we have here. It's a valuable, valuable, valuable tool. And uh, our community, I hope, can uh, reach out and appreciate it more than they really do because these exhibits that you're sharing tonight that will be coming are fabulous. Thank you very much. Thank you're you off so to a much. great start. Thank you. My question was related to student engagement, so I think she's covered that. But we're glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think it is important to note that the, and we, we appraise our art, and we ensure our art, and we store a lot of it. It is donated art. We don't spend public dollars for acquisition of art, but we do spend public dollars to keep the lights on and to operate yep. the Nurban. Um, and so that is a commitment that taxpayers have made um, to, this, to this museum and to the entire campus because it's all over campus, not just inside, but outside as well. So thank you. You, have a big, you. you do have big shoes to fill, but I'm pretty confident you can do it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. Mr. Chair, trustee, that concludes my report. All right. The, the next item on the agenda is new business. The item on new business is something that was discussed at the Committee of the Whole, determination of officers and liaisons and appointment of a nominating committee. Um, and I think you all know that our, our policies as they sit today would have this board elect officers in December that would take office in January. We have done it that way ever since I've been on the board. I don't know how far back it goes. The proposal was that we change that policy. And you'll remember we're reviewing all all board um, series 100 policies that apply to the board are going to be reviewed, and we put all those off till the new board, um, except this one. Um, so the, the real question tonight, and what you have in your packet beginning at page 41, is whether, the, whether to change the policy so that at the January meeting, the, the, the new board would elect their own officers and confirm the appointments to our various liaison positions, Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Johnson County Education Research Triangle, uh, and the foundation, um, I think, are the ones that have liaison for them. So um, in beginning at page 41 are, are some proposed changes. Um, these were originally, the concept was originally suggested by Trustee Lawson before she resigned. These have been cleaned up a little bit um, with, with Kelsey Nazar's help, uh, my input, and Dr. Bounds. The, the only new concept I want to make bring to your attention is on page 41 that suggest, I added at, at my suggestion with Dr. Bounds' uh, support, to, to be eligible as chair, a board member shall have served at least one full year as member of the board. Um, I, don't, I don't know that there's a big risk of a board ad, uh, approving a brand new member as a chair, but that would put it in policy that they'd have to serve at least one year. So I think we're at the point now simply to find out if there is a, a motion and a second to adopt a policy change at this point. Um, I'll tell you e whether this is adopted or not. My plan is to appoint a nominating committee, and I've talked to both Dr. Cook and, and Trustee Smith Everett, because the, the appointment of a policy of a nominating committee is not changed by these. It's still in the policy. Um, and the nominating committee is approved by the board. And if, as you know, in the past, it will talk to all of the members, including the incoming members of the new board, to make recommendations for nominations, although we always will take and still take nominations from the floor. So um, I, I think it might be best just to start out with discussion and then see if we move to the point of a motion. 
<laughs> that would either move to adopt what is in your packet or some version of that. Dr. Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I've been on the board 12 years. Uh, in the early days, uh, people could serve as chair for a long period of time. And if you look at the history of the college, we've had some chairs serve several years. And I, and I think the reason we, we wanted to change it was so that um, uh, new thought could prevail, new leadership could prevail. We went to a two-year program uh, where you could serve for two years and then be off, and you could be reelected again to serve another two-year term, uh, which I think has happened to both you and, and myself. Uh, and while we, while we were concerned about someone being in the chair for many years uh, and, and how that might impact the decision-making for the board and the college, uh, the other end is also true, and I appreciate you putting in at least the one year of service. Uh, the, the sustainability of the college going forward is really important uh, in terms of the governance of this, of this group. And so whatever the decision is, whether it's this board or the new board coming in to choose the officers, I, I would hope that the, that the board would really look at um, the responsibility of the chair, the responsibility of all the officers, and, and decide what's in the best interest of the college going forward for leadership of the governing body. One of the things that has to happen with the new policy is to establish a procedure in January who's going to open the meeting before there's an election. And so the way this does this is that the outgoing chair would call that meeting to order and start with Pledge of Allegiance, roll call, and move immediately into elections. And then the newly elected chair would take over. Mm -hmm. um, if the outgoing chair is not on the incoming board for, because of resignation or it wasn't reelected, then the vice chair, the outgoing vice chair, would chair the meeting. And, and I, I put in there with Kelsey and Dr. Bounds help if the vice chair is not I mean we could have you could go all the way down so I, I put the I put the longest serving member ultimately so you'll go down the road like we usually do chair vice chair treasurer secretary and then by seniority as to how long you've served on the board so so that's in there as to how the January meeting would happen given all the hypothetical possibilities of who might not be here um, uh, by the time of that meeting Trustee Cross. Yes, I thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank Trustee Cook for his comments, and I, and I would agree with him, and I'll probably move for the acceptance of this recommendation, so I thank you for your, your drafting of it. And I, I did want to just point out, um, well, I've had differences with, with both of your chair uh, no, you positions. <laughs> uh, I have respected it, and I felt that, that you were fair, and I think that the governance of this college has been difficult the last eight years. Uh, so you've had my confidence, even if you've had my disagreement. <laughs> And so I just wanted to say that and then say that um, we just came through a campaign. It wasn't that bad, but it was a campaign. And um, as a young political science student, I appreciate Professor Yu being here. Uh, you learn that so often everybody thinks a president, let's say, or a governor has this executive power, and it's, it's immense. And I think some have learned while you're most powerful, you're not all powerful, and that often the office holder is shaped by events more than he or she shapes events. So I think the leadership is key um, in, in wherever we're at in terms of enrollment or budget. Um, I, I know that you all have done your best, and so I appreciate that. And I, I just wanted to take this time to, uh, to say that. And I could say so much more, and I, I would wax on, but I'll, I'll stop there uh, and just say I'll support the recommendation. I thought you were going to eliminate the two-year term limit. <laughs> You could do it forever, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> no, no, no. All right, Trustee Snyder. Uh, I also agree with, with this recommendation, and I wasn't able to participate in the committee the whole meeting, so I don't know how much all these things were, were discussed. I, I do uh, believe that there should be changes to the, the prohibition on serving two consecutive years. Uh, when, when I joined this board, uh, that, that was... Uh, a surprise to me, I guess. I, I didn't. I, I understand historically why it was done. I guess there was one trustee that was chair for 10 or 15 years, or maybe longer. I don't know. I, 
I don't see any any way that would really happen in the future necessarily. So it's always struck me as a little arbitrary and unnecessary. Uh, so, so if people were willing, I, I would certainly um, promote eliminating that section or at least adjusting the, the years, two years. You've done this now for, for 23 months and, and after next month, you, you'll be close to understanding yeah. how everything works. But it is a lot of work. Uh, I know when I was chair of the Johnson County Board, Johnson County Parks and Recreation District Board, um, I, I asked to be chair for another year and that was the first time that had ever happened in the history uh, just because the learning curve is so immense as you go through and, and do, do a chairmanship. Uh, you're just exposed to a lot of things and it seems unnecessary to, to stop that learning if someone's interested and willing to do it for longer. So I, I guess I, I would hesitate to, to make a motion to do that without some more discussion to see where everyone else lands on that. Other comments? I think the, the general concept is, does the January board or does the December board elect officers? That's, that's the change and then we have implementation processes for that. Trustee Smith Everett? Um, yes, so I, um, I would begin with, I am in support of the first policy change, which is um, that uh, in order to be eligible to be chair, you would need to have served one full year. I think, as Paul just spoke to tr uh, Trustee Snyder, that we the learning curve is incredibly steep, um, and I think that that is an, an important um, safety mechanism um, for the staff, really, of JCCC, that somebody comes in and has an understanding before taking on chair. So I would support that. Um, I was trying to read while you were talking, Trustee Snyder, does it actually say in the next policy portion about the limits? Um, it's in policy 11102 on page 41, the second paragraph. To, be, to promote varied representation, no trustee may be nominated for or serve in the same office for more than two consecutive years at a time. You have to step away for at least 12 months. Right. Under that. So I, I, I guess I differ a little bit on that one. Um, I do think, I, I see both sides. One, one is the incredibly steep learning curve and the time commitment that it takes. And I think those of us with young children know that the person who um, selects or, or agrees to be chair is making a very large professional and personal commitment um, to the college, which not everyone can do. But I also think that, um, to Dr. Cook's point, I, I think we, I think the freshness, the newness, the way that things, some, sometimes some of us are just better equipped to do some things and having a, a, a new way to do it really helps you think differently and see things differently and I think that's important too. So I might move to make it four years, no, no more than four years as chair because then I think you really are, you're getting into holding on too long when freshness is, um, may be needed um, in that, just so you, you allow for the learning curve, but also a little bit of a protective measure to not have somebody serve uh, 12 years or whatever was mentioned earlier. That's progress. That my two cents. Lee? Just, just to, if, if I may, Mr. Chair, to address this point, I, I, I rather enjoy this policy. I think it is a blend of, of uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Congress in terms of how, <clears throat> for better or for worse, we have people like S Senator McConnell or, or, or Speaker Pelosi that have been around for decades. So they see and understand how the system works. So we get the benefit of their institutional knowledge, subject to, you know, direct election. But I think here we, we've term limited it so we can keep the person around for institutional knowledge, but then still have them around, um, you know, for better or for worse. And I had input and, and was approached in my interest to be vice chair and chair in 2017. I'm not sure that's publicly known. I've touched on it in these meetings. It wasn't a political or partisan political issue in terms of who was chair of this committee. Uh, nevertheless, um, we have a new board coming in and I, 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 I adore this policy as written. We get to keep the, the member around for institutional knowledge and yet we do get new leadership. I, I, I understand and respect um, Trustee Snyder's position, and, and it, you know, we've seen committee chairs in Congress or other committees serve forever, you know, if, if they can continue to be reelected. I just 
re respectfully disagree on this point. I, I support this policy as we've had it in it as written. Jerry. Well, I, I don't want to belabor the fact, but I, but I think Trustee Smith Everett makes a great point in terms of the time commitment. And I will attest that as chair, you devote a lot more time to the college than if you're not the chair. When I look at this board with three new board members coming on and obviously have the less than one year experience, I believe that Trustee Ingram, again, is uh, president of KCCT. Uh, and, and I applaud you for taking that on again because that, that is not a, a light task to work with the 19 colleges. So again, I would say that the, the, the two year thing was, I don't know that we spent a lot of time discussing why two years. I'm kind of intrigued by your notion of four years, maybe three. But uh, I, think, I think the board should also look, what are the circumstances of the trustees at this current time? And what are the challenges of the college? And so uh, again, I would just say that how, if we go back to the fundamental purpose of a trustee, at least in my humble opinion, what can we do to make sure the president is successful? What can we do to make sure this college is successful? And um, uh, so I, 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 I think you just need to examine the players that are eligible to be chair, and then, and then uh, whether it's decided in December or January, uh, I, I like the notion of the new board having input, uh, but at the same time, how can this board best serve the president of the college, uh, the faculty, the staff, and, and uh, uh, the students. So examine, examine the situation. Maybe three is better, maybe four years are better. I, I, two years was a, let's do two years. And let me, let me suggest some. We have two policies that, that are proposed to be amended, at least in the agenda packet. Um, I, why don't we take them separately would that be an easier way to do it? I mean, 111.02, um, the only changes would be to, you have to serve for one full year, and then we added that any office would be filled following nomination in a second from the floor by members of the board to, to help make it clear that, that the nominating committee is not the be all and end all. Um, of that, so. To put it on for a discussion, I'll move the approval of uh, policy 111.02 as you've described. So moved. Our second, sorry. Moved by Trustee Cook and seconded by Trustee Smith Everett to adopt the revisions to policy 111.02 as shown on page 41 and 42 of the board packet. Um, further discussion, Laura, you had your hand up. Yes, yeah, so it just occurred to me that maybe the compromise would be, we had always intended um, when we discussed this uh, with orientation and the board policies that we would look at all 100 series policies. And so what we could do essentially tonight is adopt these as written, but knowing that if we are, if we are looking at all 100 series policies, these essentially would be in that revision and, and looking at that when the new board comes on board and when we have that retreat. And so we could then have further discussion at that time and be able to uh, modify change or adopt with the input of the new board so that we can have this resolved tonight and still be able to talk about it another time. And I assume that will still be true of the new board and the new chair, that they'll want to go th right. through that policy review. Yeah. But um, it's been moved and seconded. Just further discussion, Nancy? Well, I, I just want to clarify something, and, and I appreciate your comments that you just made, because I think that was, you know, this board sat here and decided that they did not want to review policies. Right. And so I brought that up a month ago and just was as a reminder to all of us that we had indicated that we did not want to change these policies. We wanted to wait until the new board was in place. That is fine. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, but I just wanted you know, to appreciate your comments for that, because we had indicated, you know, we wanted to wait until the new board came, and that's why all everyone's input, Laura and I did not see it. It is still in the hands, I believe, of Kelsey Nazar, if I'm not mistaken, um, so that there is anticipation of further discussion on all of these policies that relate to us as a board. Yeah. So, I agree. The second thing that I did want to share is, you are very kind. Um, KACCT will have their uh, elections in December. Um, 
as of right now, I just have to say, you know, no one has offered to be president. <laughs> <laughs> so, because we're um, so good. But I, but I just want to go on record as saying I am not elected at this point. And I, I just want to say that. That's not fair to say. Um, but, you know, someone could be nominated from the floor. So I just want to share that. Elections with are next week in prep? Uh, December 3rd and 4th. Yeah, actually the morning of the 4th. Oh, okay. Right. But it's only the liaisons who will be able to vote, Lee. I was trying to think of an argument to my wife to justify going. Oh, okay. Anyway, so I just, I didn't want to misrepresent, you know, thank you. whether I serve or not serve, just so everybody's clear on that. So, thank you. Paul. Oh. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to offer an amendment to this. I don't know that we have an established policy. We've really only had one trustee that's tried to amend things the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so I, I would just say my amendment would be to change the two years to four years for the how long you can serve in a leadership position. And my rationale for that is, is simply to give the nominating committee more flexibility heading into uh, you know, their recommendation process. And if the new board, when they review these things in January, February, whenever they, they do that, um, they can simply change it back with, if the new board decides that that's not a workable solution. I think that's a, a, a minor step forward. And again, really just to give the nominating committee a little more flexibility um, as they come up with a recommendation for the new board. So you're referring to the second policy change? Well, it, it's in this particular policy, um, 111.02, but that... In the second uh, paragraph, it would say for mo no more than... They're not yeah. serving the same yeah. office for more than four consecutive years instead of two. Is that the motion? Correct. I, if, if I can. Yeah, this, we, need, we need a second. A second. Yeah. Seconded by Trustee Cook. Discussion, Trustee Cross. Yeah, I, I think I've served with three chairs. Trustee um, Melody Rail was chair when I uh, joined the board. Uh, I'm editing things she's told me, and I, I know she had a difficult year. I mean, I think a lot of things were public, and, and frankly, with what I know now, the 12, 13 year was a difficult year in the history of the college. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't agree uh, with changing it from four to two. I think in an unpaid board position, um, you, you know, it, it frankly forced me to pay attention as Trustee Cook uh, would chide me and encourage me to be involved and, and, and um, at a minimum, I was a brain on the board, and, and they needed me to pay attention and understand what was going on. So I think at, at four years, uh, I, I mean, I'm not, it's not a hill I want to die on, but I, I just, I like it at, as written at two. I'll be quiet. Other discussion? Do we vote on, mine is procedural. We will vote on the amendment first. first. <laughs> the amendment would be to change the two years to four years. Okay. I don't have a strong feeling about that. Um, I want to make it clear that I do not intend to serve as chair beginning in January, regardless of what these policy choices are. That's not, you know, it's it's not for any uh, negative reason, but um, I understand. It is a. Is it is the a, amendment to change from two to four? The amendment is to change from yeah. two to four. So we vote so on that first. We we'll vote on that first. That's correct. So. I'm, I'm ready to vote. All those in favor of the amendment, which would change the term limit from two consecutive years to four consecutive years, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Motion fails three to three with trustees Cook, Musil, and Snyder voting in favor. Okay, we're back to the full motion, which would be to adopt 111.02 on page 41 as presented. Any further discussion on that? If not, um, all those in favor of the modifications to 111.02 signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. That motion carries 6-0. We're now to the more, I think, the more dramatic change, which is the, which would be the election of the officers in January, um, with uh, an implementation process to do that for the organizational meeting. I might also note that we have referenced in our policies, the quote, 
capital O organizational capital M meeting, but have never defined it. So this would define the organizational meeting as the January meeting of the board. Each January we would have an organizational meeting. Um, um, I, I am in support of this policy change. I have, it is, the, the current system has worked well. I don't think it's been a problem, but I think it is appropriate to allow the new board to select its officers and liaison uh, positions. Um, simply because that is the new board that was elected by the folks in Johnson County. So, Trustee Snyder. Just a, a point, uh, this, this policy does not say that it would happen at the board meeting in January, just that it would happen in January. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, just pointing that out. That if the intentions that it happened at the board meeting, we might want to specify that. Uh, the organization of the board, including selection of board officers and committees, will be voted on by the board in January of each year. Do we need to add at the regular meeting of the board in January? Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Okay. All right. Anybody have a problem with that as a friendly amendment? No. That, that, that's a good catch. I think that that's what yeah. was intended. Yeah. Okay. Is there a motion of any kind with respect to policy 112.00 as amended. If not, it will stay the way it is. Uh, Trustee smith Everett. Okay. Mine is more of a strange procedural behind the scenes question. When we have new trustees coming on board, your chair is your first line of communication as a new trustee and then the president, obviously. So it was unclear when I came on board when you, when, if we are having orientation before this January meeting, you go to the current chair. And then after this meeting, I'm just talking out loud and realizing the answer is very apparent, but I needed to say it out loud to clarify in my head, because it was never clear to me as a new board member that the changing of the chair would happen at the very first meeting. So that change will mean that you then thereafter, after that meeting, if there is a new chair elected, that would be your chair that you communicate with. And now I know the answer right. to my own question. Thank right. you. Okay. It's, it's good to work these out and walk through these. I mean, it really is. So, Trustee Snyder. I was just going to make a motion if you're yep. ready. Yep. Uh, I move we adopt the changes to the special meetings of the board proceed operating procedures 112.01 as amended to indicate that. We're just, we're just adopting, we're amending the board policy that cross references the procedure. 12. Right? Correct. So moved. <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> okay, so there's a motion on the floor to adopt the proposed changes to policy 112.00, which cross references to a board operating procedure 112.01, which would not change. So, is there a second to his to Trustee Snyder's motion? Second. Seconded by Trustee Smith Everett. Is there a discussion? I just want to yeah. clarify, does that or does not that not include the reference to the regular meeting? That would include the friendly amendment that the January regular meeting is when we would have an organizational, would be our organizational meeting each year. Okay. Yeah. Discussion? If not, all in favor of the amendment as shown on pages 43 through 40. Six of your board packet with the additional friendly amendment that the January of each year meeting would be the regular meeting in, in January. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. That motion carries 6 0. The next item, we have no old business. The next item on the agenda then is our consent agenda. The consent agenda is a collection of various items that have been uh, approved by college policy or otherwise routine and administrative, and they're usually handled in one motion and one vote. Any trustee has the right to pull anything off the consent agenda. Is there any trustee that would like to pull any individual item from the consent agenda tonight? If not, I'd accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. <coughs> moved by Trustee Cross and seconded by Trustee Cook to approve the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Opposed, no. That carries 6-0. Um, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. 
Moved by Trustee Cook, seconded by Trustee Ingram. All in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Opposed no. Carries 6-0. Thank you all for your patience. Good meeting. Happy We're adjourned.